Welcome back. As we've learnt, the deposition of calcium carbonate is a critical feature associated with the majority of coral reefs. Healthy coral reefs have a complex three-dimensional framework in which thousands of species find habitat. The framework of coral reefs is primarily generated by reef building corals, the dead skeletons of which build up over time and are glued together by organisms such as red coralline algae. Now on the other side of the equation are a range of processes which remove calcium carbonate from the reef framework. Eroding organisms and storms are two processes on coral reefs which remove large amounts of calcium carbonate. Now it's the balance between these two processes, calcification on one hand and decalcification on the other, which is referred to as the carbonate balance of coral reefs. The carbonate balance of coral reefs is the focus of today's lecture. As part of a sequence of ideas, I'd like to do several things. Firstly, I want to take a look at the processes forming calcium carbonate and how we me measure those on coral reefs. In doing this, we will delve into the process of calcification and we'll examine which organisms are able to precipitate calcium carbonate and how they contribute to the process of building the structure of coral reefs. Secondly, I want to look at the processes that remove calcium carbonate from coral reefs. In this respect, I want to describe a range of organisms that contribute to the erosion of calcium carbonate from coral reefs. This will also lead me to a discussion of physical impacts such as storms that have important impacts on the structure and function of coral reefs. And lastly, I want to introduce the important influence of atmospheric carbon dioxide on the rates of calcification and decalcification. Now this is a topic which will be picked up later in the course when we come to discuss global warming and ocean acidification. Calcification is highest in the warm sunlit waters of the tropics and subtropics where the concentrations of calcium carbonate ions is highest. Here a range of organisms from cnidarians such as reef building corals, algae, mollusks, crustaceans and small creatures known as foraminiferans are able to deposit large amounts of calcium carbonate from the surrounding water column. Importantly, the surrounding water column is supersaturated with calcium carbonate ions, which means that there's abundant sources of materials to make the crystals of calcite and aragonite, which are used to build the shells and skeletons of marine organisms in these parts. If you're unfamiliar with those two terms, calcite and aragonite, please refer to an earlier lecture where they were explained. Now given the importance of calcification to reef ecosystems, scientists have come up with a number of ways of measuring calcification. Now one methodology involves putting corals in a non-toxic dye and putting them back out in the field. If the skeleton is then cut open at a later stage, it's possible to see the stained layer within the skeleton and it's possible to calculate how much calcium carbonate has been laid down since that die mark. Now while this is a useful technique, it does involve killing the coral, which has implications for the types of questions one can ask using it. Another way to measure calcium carbonate is to measure the rate of incorporation of radioactive molecules such as calcium 45 into the skeletons of corals and other organisms. Now to do this, corals are incubated in seawater in which a small amount of radioisotope has been added. Over time, the radioisotope is deposited uh, with, along with non-radioactive -radio isotopes of calcium and it's used as a measure of the rate at which the calcium carbonate is being formed. Now this technique is very precise but it has some negative consequences like it's not possible to do this in the field, it always has to be done under controlled laboratory conditions. A third way of measuring calcification is to use the buoyant weight method. In this method, coral fragments or other calcifying organisms are weighed underwater. Now if you know the density of calcium carbonate, you can then calculate the amount of calcium carbonate that's been added to the coral over time or the organism in question. Now this is a very useful technique because it can be done safely under field conditions and does not involve killing the coral to get a measurement. 
that means that multiple measurements can be made over a series of time points uh, in order to answer some questions about calcification under both laboratory and field conditions. There are still other ways of measuring calcification. One of the most important methodologies is based on the fact that long-lived corals like parietes put down a layer of calcium carbonate each year, much like a tree lays down a ring of wood each year. Biologists interested in studying long-term changes can visualise yearly bands using techniques such as X-ray radiography to get a picture of, the, of how calcification has changed over time. And just like a tree, dark lines delineate the beginning and end of each year of calcium carbonate. This has led to some important observations about calcification rates going back hundreds of years. In this next exercise, you'll be using real coral cores from the Great Barrier Reef to understand how calcification has changed over time and between environments. Coral cores have become an important part of the climatological record. Coral cores that you're working with here were collected from different environments. Explore how calcification has changed over time and look at the differences between the environments. As part of this exercise, you'll be asked to comment on why the differences between coral cores exist. To do this, you'll need to draw on your knowledge from previous lectures.